All right, so on a wing and a prayer, we're going to try this. Hopefully it's working. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so let's do this attendance thing, shall we? What do you say? Sounds like a plan. There we go. Heather Alvarado. You, there you are. Alan. Here. Ah, yes. David. Oh, yes, maybe. No, no, David. Too. Where? David Baldini, yeah? Oh, well, where is he? What are you, oh, all right. Julian. There you are. All right, I'm going to step over here because I'm like, I'm blinded. Alex. Where's Alex? Oh. oh, that's right. He said it was Logan. There you are. Thank you. Celine. Back there. Peter just walked in. Satora. Hi. Ilana. Hi. Elliot. Lane. Yeah. Uh, Lucas. No, no Lucas. Elliot Murphy. Hi. Heather. Murray. Lariva. Evan. Wiley, no Wiley, ah, Colin, Colin's here, Naomi's not here, that's surprising, and Josh, all right, and Ben, okay, All right, so um, in a hopefully familiar routine, um, go ahead and log in, grab the 11 folder from the in-class resources, and download it to your desktop. I have already done this, and so hopefully it will all work out. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, we will be using it relatively soon in the class tonight. So uh, in a, in a uh, hopefully positive development, things ha I will not, I'm not planning on talking a lot tonight. So yeah, it should, uh, we will be doing instead of talking, which will make everyone happier at this point. So, uh, okay, here's what we're gonna talk about this week. Motion tracking. So a lot, uh, this has come up in some of the weekly questions and um, obviously uh, a lot of you have a lot of interest in being able to do this. So let's, we can talk about it in some detail today. Um, so yeah, we're gonna do it in, uh, in a variety of forms. We'll get to that in the, the brief. I think I've got three slides for the whole uh, you know, discussion of what it is. Um, and most of that is just so that you kind of set the expectations in your mind. So what we're gonna talk about this week, questions from last week, and then motion tracking, point 3D tracking and surface tracking. So uh, those are the three types we will explore uh, together. That's in that After Effects project that you are downloading. So let's, without any further ado, let's get into questions from last week. Uh, first off, how do you recommend adding our motion graphics into the semester project? Uh, this has been uh, something of a, uh, I guess, a point of anxiety for some of you. It is, um, so how would I recommend that? So part of it is uh, looking for the, the motion graphics that I'm looking for in this film or in, in the semester project are the opening titles the um, lower third introduction of Mark McAfee, the deaths by food type, which is the big infographic build, and then, um, and I may, I may make this something of, a, of an opportunity for extra credit is the closing titles. 
those are the only places where I'm expecting to see motion graphics. Those three places that I say, you know, opening, the lower third, the motion graphic. I also have that quarantine, which I still haven't provided you guys. And I feel like, yeah. Um, but it is a, um, and let me, actually, let me, uh, let me, let me find that. So for, for whatever reason, what I'd like to suggest here is CDFA, um, press release. Oh, look, it hits Google searches. Um, from 2011 or 20 should be press release archive 2011. Um, and then you get to November uh, 15th, I think is when it was. There it is right here. View this press release. This is the actual press release that I used in the video. Okay. So I will add this link. Um, where will I add that link? Where should I add that link? I'll put it in Canvas. Where should, where would you like me to put it in Canvas? There's a semester project. I'll it's put it in the semester project. project and I'll put a big, I'll put a big box around it or something. So that it's like, Hey, here's the link to the press release. So the way that I've did this in the past was, um, there's, uh, in fact, I think this is almost exactly what I did for the video is I clicked print this release and then I actually screen, I, I did a, a screen capture, uh, or, a, a, a screenshot of this portion of the press release. And then I just rolled it up on the screen. It was the dumbest motion graphic in my whole film. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, it's what I would love to see there. And maybe this is another opportunity for some, uh, for some additional, uh, you know, consideration for your project is realistically finding, um, finding a couple of, uh, uh, phrases from this, that you can overlay onto it. Now you sometimes will see that in news in news reports or in um, documentaries where they'll show a news clipping and, and it's the headline and then there's a wall of text that's super tiny and you can't really make it out. And then they kind of lay over the top a, a little trans uh, semi-transparent bar and then a, a, a quote from the article is, is put up on screen. That would be pretty cool. That's something that's above and beyond what I did. Hey, and if, if there's any way to impress Randy, this is, this could be one of them. All right. So keep that in mind. Um, but I'll put this link into, uh, I'll leave it up on the web browser so that I, I'm not, uh, I'm not likely to go. Why did I, why did I leave that up? I'll do it. Okay. But, but that needs to go into the, um, into canvas under the semester project okay so there's that okay so those are the those are the motion graphics opportunities that i'd like you to consider um but the ones i'm really looking for opening titles lower third and the big infographic build big infographic build will take you some time that said you know, you have a visual reference that you can start from, which is the one that I did. Um, you can always choose to embellish or, uh, you know, whatever you choose to do. Uh, in conversation earlier before class started, uh, it came up that, you know, I used, uh, you know, relatively neutral icons in, to, to kind of express the visual, visually express the impact of a certain food that has killed people. Um, the fact that I used a neutral image or an icon is, was, a, was a, an actual choice on my part. Uh, you can choose to make it more gruesome, uh, but uh, that's up to you, you know? It's, so, or, you know, and how it, how it builds in is, is obviously gonna be uh, an area where you will be able to exercise some artistic license. Okay, so I think I've pounded that one enough. Let's move on. Why is working with cameras in depth of field and After Effects so complicated? Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, let me get my water because what you have to understand is that I'm coming off a head cold and so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. That's the other reason why I don't want to talk very much to me. So, uh, well, 
working with cameras and uh, 3D animation in general, and definitely depth of field, are very taxing on a, on a computer. It's like having the computer think about what's in focus takes a lot of time for it because you actually have to establish for that camera what in focus looks like, where, at, what, what, at what depth, at what Z um, coordinate depth is the actual camera supposed to be sharp? And then at what point does it start to fall off into being blurry or out of focus? So what's the, what is the plane of focus? What's the depth of that focus? And this, you guys know some amount of this through, uh, well, if you've taken the, the, the production class, Media 20, and, and worked with Brian on this, he's hopefully taught you some of these techniques in that when you, um, when you stop down a lens from being wide open, you provide deep focus for, your, for, for that camera in terms of what, how it's gonna, uh, what, what will be sharp or considered sharp visually. Um, when you talk about uh, the size of your, the sensor that's in your camera, smaller sensors will automatically have a deeper focus because they're just smaller. I mean, it has to do partially with the resolution that they could possibly comprehend. Um, and then uh, the, the last thing to think about is, uh, well, that might, that might be the last thing to think about. It's like the, 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 that process of figuring out what's in focus, what's out of focus, and then making the things that are out of focus blurry, that's a, that's a, computational, ta that's a computational cost to your, uh, to your computer. So it slows things down. So it is common practice in, uh, when you're working in compositing to do depth of field kind of last um, before you are, you know, it's later on in the, in the, in the 3D camera kind of workflow is to work depth of fit. You might work the settings earlier and figure out if you're going to do a focus pull, you obviously want to have that be something that you, you, you would view and you turn depth of field on to be able to, to see it. But then if you need to do other work in that comp, you might, turn off depth of field so that you can keep working at a, at a decent clip. So that's kind of all I, that's kind of what I have to say on that. It's, uh, it's just, it's not complicated other than the fact that working with cameras in the real world can be complicated. You, you know, you talk about, what was I, I just had my, I have a Canon 60D that I've been using for years now. And that can, that, that camera is remarkably sophisticated. Uh, in terms of the the level of of you know tweaking you can do to the settings to just get it just the way you need it, so um, yeah. After Effects rabbit hole has no bottom. Enjoy. Okay, would it be better to do a complicated focus rack in After Effects or in camera? Well, that depends on what you're what what you're doing. If it's something that has to be composited in After Effects. Obviously, in camera is not going to be an option. But uh, if you uh, if it's something where you could do it in After Effects or in camera, I would always choose to try and capture it in camera. Again, I think I answered this last week. Um, the the preference is always to to do effects in camera if you possibly can, with the understanding that you are you're not going to have infinite budget and infinite ability to. Uh, you know, spend countless sums of money to get, to get the effect in camera, then maybe you, you switch to plan B, which is, okay, well, we can, we can do it in After Effects. We'll fix it in post, as the famous last words of every production. Okay. Would the mass track in After Effects be what you would use to cover up the type of shot where a camera is shooting someone looking into a mirror? And there's a link. I wonder where it goes. Um, let's have a look. Uh, so this is actually, I'm going to turn this off because this should be a little bit enjoyable at least. So um, I chose a, a VFX breakdown from Black Swan. Okay. So here you go.
Watch, watch, watch how thoroughly they work this, this thing out. And here's where you would remove. Okay, so what are we seeing here? They, you saw that they put a clean plate of background for the floor and the wall, and then they blurred it, and that gets rid of the crew. It also gets rid of the guy, the director, and the dancer. So what do you think they did? They masked around, and we're gonna talk about what that is. That's rotoscoping. They basically cut around the director, his reflection in the mirror so that it stays, but the camera, has been removed, okay? So, but th these, these compositing techniques absolutely are within your reach in this program, okay? You just have to think about the workflow. How, might, how would you go about removing the camera from a reflection, okay? So some of this is, and, and a considerable amount of this is done with motion tracking, which we're, we're gonna talk about again today, so. They did face removal, face replacements. Make them all look like her, so she starts freaking out. Wait, what? And then they stretch her hands. And then they get kind of really crazy where they're doing reflections of behavior, you know, reflections where she sees different things. You see that scratching person in the background. Here's another one. We call this the hero plate because this is the this is kind of like the the money the, the foreground shot. The reflection element is a background shot, and then you composite the two. And this was an easy composite to make. this but this is a pretty psychologically disturbing movie okay you want to see like the see somebody like go downhill uh paranoid schizophrenia you know well yeah but still uh it this was this was really interesting uh so the fact that they did provide a vfx breakdown of how they did some of these effects um, kind of can th this is this is absolutely research for you guys. You guys should be watching VFX reels as much as you can if you want to build any confidence and repertoire. And and what you, well, the 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 beautiful moment for you guys is when you finish this class, you watch some of these VFX reels, and you go, you know, I'm, I know how they did that. And then you're like, oh, I bet I could do something similar. Or, wow, I wonder what it would take for me to try to, to do that yourself. And then another career in VFX is, is launched and perhaps ruined. But, you know, that's another matter entirely. Okay, so uh, let's get back to, um, to the, the slides. What's that? I, I do not. They didn't go into detail as to what tools they used and that. Um, but seeing uh this was this was not a big studio production this was like a, a fox searchlight sort of thing wasn't it or focus features or Lionsgate or who oh no 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 i don't mean that i mean uh it wasn't it wasn't like a warner brothers universal it was it was like their indie wings that did so they uh what i was trying to get to is that their tooling might have been more mainstream like what you can find off the shelf as opposed to some custom thing like what Pixar might use or, or um, 
you know, Weta Workshop and, and Lord of the Rings and, and that sort of stuff, even though The Hobbit ruined pretty much all of what Weta did for us. Um, that's, that's another matter entirely. Probably, yeah. This was just picked up off of the YouTube because I was like, ah. I, I remember as soon as I saw that question, I thought, I want to show the camera removal from Black Swan. I bet you I can find that. And I did. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of an unfortunate reality of, of the, the online delivery model. Yeah, usually if you want to get like the extras that you normally get with, through DVDs and other stuff like that, Blu-rays, um, you're, you're probably going to buy that, that uh, copy of that, not go to, to Netflix, which is basically like the red box of, it's not even that good, is it? No, all right. Uh, okay. Let's keep moving. Can you use the mass tracker to repair and animate still photos? I have no idea what this means. Um, so to repair and animate still photos? Um, well, you know, it is, uh, you know, After Effects has considerable uh, amounts of capability that is, that is similar to Photoshop. So if it's something where you can re you can repair still photos in After Effects, you don't need the mask tracker to do it. You can use the clone stamper, or you can use uh, you know you you can mask things, but uh, mask tracker is really for moving objects. If it's a still image, it's not moving, so masking a still image is pretty pretty easy. Um, and then if that if that still image is then animated through a scene or distorted or done other things too, that's all done through other things than mass tracking. So that's kind of where I'm going. With this. Like, um, so I don't think that the I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know, whatever. Okay. Um, I saw that and I was just like, oh, that's an interesting question. I don't think I know the answer to that no, uh, as worded. Ask, the only reason I asked that question because of Burns effect and the way he moves things around. Uh -huh. And so I was just wondering if. Yeah, you, know what I'm saying? In terms of yep. the way you can animate a mask and use that to uh, uh, for some effect, but I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I mean, the the short answer is: Can you use Mask Tracker to animate still photos? Probably, because the rabbit hole has no bottom. Um, so, so I mean, and and again, I I try not to say that just to be dismissive, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, so Photoshop would be better. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, not for animating stills. So if you're, if you're trying to do a Ken Burnsian like thing, nice. that's something you can do in Premiere really. But, uh, if it's, if it's where you want to do a Ken Burns kind of move where it's panning and maybe zooming or zooming in or out of a still image, and then you want to do something additional to that. Like maybe you want to mask off the background and then have the background rippling like water or something like that. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's what you, uh, it's, it's, it's how you want to, um, you know, how you want to put your creative mark on whatever your, whatever the visual is. So if you see, if it's a, if it's a still image, and again, this is like, we're just making stuff up as we go. Um, if it's a still image of a lake and a canoe, and you want the lake to be rippling like it's actually these be like these uh, uh, they're not they're not they're not gifs they're not still images they're somewhere in between there's a name for them and I can't remember what it's called but it's a cinemagraph or something like that it's a I don't remember it's something along those lines but it's like there's some motion involved and it kind of gives a hint of motion without actually it's moving cinemagraph. anything cinemagraphs yeah. okay so uh, you know th that's a technique you can employ and then you know, pan a camera across it to impress your friends and neighbors. It's, it, it's all possible. But that would be something that you would use masking for, um, but it wouldn't be a track because the tracking is really moving the camera across the, the photo as opposed to moving the mask. Does that make sense? Okay, well, I'm trying. So, okay, next question. What is the benefit to choosing to track backwards instead of forward? Um, the chief benefit of this is that when you are tracking, we'll talk about this tonight. Um, when you track, if, if you know that the point that you want to track is easier to find at the end of your footage, 
you go there, set your, your tracker, and then you start working backwards from that. Whatever is a clean place for you to start tracking, and then you can work forward or backward depending. Now, things get interesting when, you, when the pixels you're trying to track move off screen. So, yeah, that, that gets tough. But it's, um, yeah, it can be, it can be done. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the benefit really is that you can choose what point you place your tracker and then that, so it's convenient for you and then you can work backwards or forwards depending on where that foot, where you are in the footage. Oh, this is a long one. Uh, oh, this is Evans. When the feature you're looking for is no longer available, does not appear in the obsolete menu, what do you do? How do programs like Final Cut, um, oh, actually, I think that's a separate question. Uh, so we'll get to the second question in a moment. So if, if uh, an effect is no longer in the obsolete menu, I think in your case it was Fast Blur. Yeah, Fast Box Blur is, I think they renamed it. Yeah, a little bit, but I mean, they combined two, they've combined the old Box Blur and the Fast Blur into one effect. Yeah, um, you know, the funny thing, the reason, you know why the reason that there, there are a menu of obsolete effects are for, you know what that's for. So when you open an older After Effects project, your effects don't break. You know, the project doesn't break because the effects aren't there. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Um, because when you do go over here to looking under effect, of course I need to actually create a comp and blah, blah, blah. So we'll do that. Um, oh, I have to create a layer too, don't I? Yes, Randy. Okay. So we'll put a solid down and then under effects, you have obsolete and then you have fast blur right there says legacy. Um, so you don't see obsolete on yours? No, I didn't have it. Huh. Huh. There it is. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, I mean, th this is the whole point of this is so that it doesn't, um, it doesn't break your, uh, your old projects. Well, yeah, I don't know. Um, and it's under obsolete as well. But you know, like I said, for, for the new blur, they have a Gaussian blur that's yeah. that's improved. It's a different Gaussian blur than the original ones from older versions of After Effects. So yeah, um, but you should be able to find it under effect on obsolete. So I don't know, that's. Okay, well. You should be able to, um, if, if for some reason that doesn't work, you're, you're really your recourse is to just add a different effect that is similar. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and usually with blurs and uh, stuff like that, it's unless you're, unless it was, if for some reason directional blur, well, that's an interesting video you got going. Um, so uh, if it was a directional blur, that would be a tricky one to, to not have, but, um, Box blur, fast blur, those are those are kind of bread and bread and butter. Huh. Really? Yeah. Interesting. All right. Um, how do programs like Final Cut 10 and Motion compare to After Effects and Premiere for 3D and 2D animation? Okay, so this is uh, you're asking me to editorialize, so I will spend a moment to do this. Um, I used to use, well, okay, let's, let's face it. Uh, I teach high school and um, as part of that, the software that I teach in high school now is Final Cut 10. Uh, I'm not proud of this notion, but it's what the school can afford to teach. Uh, Final Cut 10 is, it, it is uh, maddening in some ways, but it is capable in others. And so you can appreciate what it can, what it's capable of doing in terms of quickly being able to um, to put together um, a sequence that. And and if you've never worked with tracks, 
if you've never worked with video tracks before like you do in Premiere, um, it's, um, it's more intuitive for somebody that's trying to, to work that way. For people that have worked with video tracks, it's maddeningly difficult because it talks, uh, Final Cut 10 talks in storylines and then you have, uh, you have uh, secondary clips that you attach to the storyline at certain points and then if for some reason you delete the thing that, the, that another thing was attached to, it's gone too. Oh my God, I, I've had so many red alerts with students that have been like, Mr. O, Mr. O, my, it's broken. And then I come over and go, oh no, undo. And they're like, oh, it's back. And I'm like, yeah, uh, okay. So, you know, it, it's, it's a workflow unlike any other video program. What are you gonna do, it's Apple. Uh, motion is, um, I use Motion 4 uh, to make the motion graphics that are in my, my documentary. So uh, I use Motion 4 a lot to make that documentary. And um, I actually find that the motion tracking, the capabilities for 3D animation in After Effects to be much better, much more predictable, much more manageable. So um, that one, I, I would say authoritatively, I would not use motion unless you had no re other option. Um, but if you have no other option, yeah, you can use motion and it'll work. It's just, you will go through a bit more pain and suffering uh, uh, for your trouble. Okay. Had a hard time with match moves in Linda. Perhaps this is something I plan to address in week 11. It is absolutely something we are going to address this week. So uh, match moves, which is basically uh, the whole point of 3D camera tracking. And uh, when you take a piece of motion footage and you run a 3D camera tracker and then you place additional items into that virtual three-dimensional space and then you light them and then you have them cast shadows on other things. It's like they belong in that space. So match moves, yeah, we're gonna talk about that. So that's, that's the good news. And I think there's one more. What are After Effects expressions? Oh, oh my goodness, that just makes me so happy. Um, so After Effects expressions, uh, we will, we'll touch on this, but um, and we're going to get to it a little bit in a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to start down that. So whereas After Effects itself uh, is a rabbit hole that has no bottom, Expressions kind of really drives that point home to you is that not only can you animate any va many of the values of any layer or content that you can put into a composition, now you can actually um, for any of those properties, you can actually give uh, a little bit of, you can either use properties of the composition, properties of the layer, properties of layers next to it, or uh, other layers or other uh, comps even that are in the same project can affect the, the behaviors that you animate in your compositions. Um, so that is like literally like, the, which one was it? The red pill, or the blue pill in Matrix. I mean, it was like, literally like, what? Uh, so, and it can, it can be both, a, it can be an intimidating experience and it can be a very exhilarating experience. So you choose how you like to ride the roller coaster. Do you want to vomit or do you want to scream enjoy? This is, uh, you have, <laughs> the choice is yours. Uh, but After Effects expressions, you definitely, we'll, show, we'll start to ease you into that. Um, I may actually ease you into that tonight um, as part of what we go through here so that you kind of get a sense of, oh, this is how you start to change values so that you relate things to one another um, in a more helpful way. Okay, so uh, let's talk about motion tracking. Okay, so that's what we're really gonna touch on tonight. Um, and it, this is related to, but not entirely the same as 3D animation. Because we talk about things like point tracking and surface tracking, those are not 3D animation topics, okay? So we're kinda, uh, you know, we've, we've we spent a couple weeks on 3D animation. Um, I almost called this 3D animation part three, but it's not because camera tracking kind of uh, is the 3D camera tracker absolutely is part of that world. It creates a 3D virtual 
uh, coordinate space for a, for a piece of video. Um, but you have two other types of, of tracking, motion tracking that you can do that actually helps you, um, can, or can be the perfect choice in certain situations. So let's talk about what those situations might be. Well, actually, let's talk about um, each type. So there's, there's point tracking, which is really good for following very, very small individual groups of pixels, pixels across the frame. Uh, and I chose those words very intentionally. You don't, I mean, it can be a group of pixels. I mean, it's like whatever pixels that are next to each other and you want to follow them from one point to another. And that pixel, it could be somebody's, it could be a car, it could be a blade of grass, it could be, uh, you know, a, a, a person's shirt, which we'll talk about. Um, it can be, you know, a, a dot on a sidewalk, it can be a dot on a green wall, it can, you know, you name it. It's like you can make all of those things into, um, uh, you know, and, and track that motion and then use it to change the behavior and make other layers look like they are uh, following along. And sometimes that's uh, where it's, um, you'd see, a, you'd see a, a live action piece and then there might be this little fly out caption that flies, that, that floats over the person's or the, the, the object's head while something's happening and it goes, hey, this is so-and-so um, you know, or this is, uh, you know, Mount Ummenham, or I don't know how many of you guys know the Santa Cruz mountains, but it's just like, you know, it's like any of those, it can be anything that you kind of, you, but that, that motion of having that, that flying caption attached to some object on screen and following it around is point tracking because it's not trying to behave like it's actually in the scene. It's not like it's part of the, the scene itself. It looks like it's composited on top. Is Surface that, tracking. Is that like in Black Swan when she's picking that stuff out of her back? No, that's, uh, um, that's, that's actually more like surface tracking to a certain degree. Um, but even that, that was more 3D graphics and CGI that was composited on top of. So it's not, it's not purely done that way but there was a surface track that was done of her skin and that's what the second one is surface tracking which is really good for mapping a, a planar surface or supposedly flat surface for you to uh to replace or or some, you're going to composite something on top of it um in after effects there's a third party tool that's delivered that it's installed when you install after effects cc it's called mocha ae we're going to use that tonight to do a little bit of surface tracking. Surface tracking, you know, the good news is, is that the old computers that used to be in here were terrible at this. Um, they were so old, they were slow, and it took a long time. These are only m mostly slow, um, so we'll probably, we'll probably have a better time with this. And then finally, 3D camera tracking, which is really good for this idea of match moves and placing objects into what I use air quotes around the real world, which is, um, you know, making it seem like that, that text is actually on the floor or that poster is on the wall, though surface tracking can do some of that poster on the wall sort of a replacement as well. Yes. So do you have Yeah. No, that, ma that, that bullet was probably computer generated and placed in the, into the scene um, and then just, you know, rendered with an alpha channel so that it just can be composited on top of something else. Yeah, it would be another layer inside of After Effects. And then that layer has motion that has After Effects. Yeah, and... and um, there's no After Effects by its, you know, vanilla After Effects, if you want to use that particular um, descriptor, descriptor is, um, doesn't have that capability to be able to composite computer generated objects. I think I've mentioned this to you before, is like the, the idea of placing an object in the 3D coordinate space for After Effects, there are 
plenty of plugins that can do that for you, but there's none that are provided with After Effects. Well, that's kind of not true. They do have Cinema 4D Lite uh, that they provide you, but that's like, I mean, who? That's, that is, uh, for, for those of you who are doing the, the computer animation um, pathway here at the JC, uh, Cinema 4D will be something you would not be upset with, but uh, it's not, uh, it's not for, for basic compositing, it's like you're asking a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, correct. And it would be what it would be is that you would do the camera track and then you would export that data and then import it into your, into your uh, CGI program. Um, so it can render the frames correctly for that. Or you would take the whole clip into that program um, and then do the, the camera track there yeah. and create that, that 3D coordinate space. Um, Yeah. That's true, and you know, but it could have it could have been that the bullet that he picked out of out of uh, out of thin air was actually a practical. Yeah. It could have been a slug that was on a line, and he just grabs it and pulls it, and then they just then they line then they remove the line that was hanging it, and then he just looks at it, and then suddenly the next thing you see is all the bullets fall to the floor. You don't see what he's holding anymore. They cut away from it. Right. And so that's plausible. That's what I would, if I had, if I had an actor interacting with something like that, that'd be my first choice is like, we'll hang a practical bullet. Right. He'll pull that one out. And even if it's like a really, it could have been just a goofy looking thing. Didn't actually look like a slug, but he could just, you know, it could have been something like that. And then they composite it out to make it look like all the other bullets. And then he pulls it up. So, but the whole, the whole line removal and all that stuff is, that's, Oh yeah, yeah. Eh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. My vote is for they would have they would have just had the the bullet hanging on a on a monofilament. But you know, hey, we can agree to disagree, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, let's move on because uh, it's yeah it's we're coming up on the break and then when we get back we'll we'll start the uh, um, the the fun. Uh, so in summary. This is really kind of the, 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 the reasons or the ways in which you would use it. Uh, motion tracking always requires some motion footage because you're tracking motion. Um, that would normally be video. However, uh, pre-comps and other compositions that you make can also be tracked. Okay, so that is, um, and in fact, when you go to do some 3D camera tracking, um, for challenging 3D camera track footage, you might use masking um, to isolate certain areas that make it easier for the tracker to solve. And then you would um, uh, pre-compose that, that mask with the layer, and then you'd run the tracker on that fixed up uh, piece of footage. So um, plenty of online tutorials about that. I don't think we'll get to it tonight, but we'll see. Uh, usually involves tracking areas with high contrast, um, that is to say if there's no texture or there's no contrast, um, it's going to make for a challenging track, okay? So uh, universally, the, the camera tracker is looking, uh, or the, all of those kind of trackers are looking for areas of contrast um, and pattern to, to make sure that it's, it's being able to follow from one frame to the next to the next. Um, it also involves a choosing a starting point to track and then running the track as, tracking process forward and backward through the timeline. So again, you find a convenient starting point, whether that, it doesn't have to be the first frame of the video. It can be, you know, the last or in the middle somewhere. And then you track backwards and forwards uh, as needed to, um, to give yourself um, everything you need. With the 3D camera tracker, that's a little more automated. And yes, mass tracking is based on motion tracking principles. So the mass tracking that you guys have uh, played with way back in early days with uh, in this class with in Premiere um, are based on this same principle. 
It's just all automated. Lucky you. Okay. Um, I think that might be, yeah. So um, let's talk about what I'm going to have you guys do today. So we, are, we will go through, when we get back from the break, we're going to use, um, we're going to open the project. It has three comps in it, okay? If you haven't already opened it, you'll, you'll see. But it has three compositions in it. Um, we'll go through the first two, which is the point tracking, and um, we'll see how well the Mocha AE tracking goes. Um, and that'll be kind of, I'll lead you through that part. And then this last part will be to use the 3D camera tracker uh, comp that's in that project. You'll select the video layer, go to the animation menu, choose track camera, let the camera tracker solve for that motion. Um, if it doesn't automatically start, you can click the analyze under the effects properties. Uh, you'll select a group of tracking points on the wall and test to see that the target that's, that appears um, actually behaves like it is on the wall. You can click and drag that target around on the screen um, and it should look like it recedes into the distance or it grows and, and comes off the screen in the foreground. So, but it looks like it's stuck to the wall. If, you, if, if you're successful, that, that's doable. Uh, then you'll, you'll use, once that target's selected, you'll add a no object and camera at the target, add a still image from the project to the layer and make it 3D, and then parent the image layer's position or rotation attributes to the null object, which is where we, talk, where we start to talk about um, expressions, okay? So, um, yeah, should be fun. But what, before we do that, we'll take a tour of, like I said, point tracking. We'll see how that looks, and then... Um, we will uh, we'll do the surface track with app with uh, Mocha AE as well, and um, have a look at um, how that goes. It's a it's a different creature, but it's it's very effective at doing what it does, and it actually um, can be used for other things, um, motion track related, including rotoscope. But we don't really we don't go into that yet. All right, so um, seven fifty three. Why don't you take a few minutes? Uh, we'll we'll pick this back up in about just a couple minutes after eight, and um, then we will. Uh, uh, so yeah, if you haven't already, go um, go here. Boy, I'm do this build backwards. Go to the the server, get the week eleven folder, drag that to your desktop, and then we will um, uh, we'll pick up when we get back from the break. Okay. I like them for days or longer. I like that. Did you get my email yesterday? I did. You need to fill that out if you want. Okay. Um, if you I'll want to do what you did yesterday, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send it yesterday. Last time. Yeah. Perfect.
Thank you. Okay. The recording. Okay. So let's um, now select again and talk about this project. You guys should all have this project. So uh, the other thing I realized is that you should, um, that this was not in the project uh, folder. Um, it was actually on this computer. So when I loaded the, when I loaded the project, this, this uh, still image was broken. The, it, it, so the link was broken. Uh, you may need to um, right click on it and go to replace footage, click on file, and then go find the, the same, the, the PNG with the same uh, name. Where do we find that again? Uh, it is back on the server. So I uploaded it to the, to the this is on um, the week 11 folder on the server under in class materials. Uh, this was not there until about a couple minutes ago. So that's why it's like, oh, hey, everybody, you need to download this. So go grab it because it will be useful. I mean, if you want to use a different image, you're certainly welcome to, but this is what I was planning on using. Okay. So for... When we talk about it, so you'll see when you open it up, there's three compositions um, in here under the compositions folder. 3D camera tracker, Mocha AE tracker, and point tracker. We'll start with the point tracker. And I've chosen the footage that's in each of these um, kind of intentionally because uh, they, they each behave a different way. So um, to show this to you. This is what the first clip looks like. It's a dude walking down a hallway. Yep, walking down the hallway. And you guys all know this stretch of hallway. Um, uh, <laughs> though this, this, I think this video is from at least two years ago. So you might not recognize the dude, but the hallway, definitely. Okay. Um, that's enough of that. So what do we talk about when we talk about point tracking? So um, the, the thing about this is I've already added a point tracker to this, um, but I wanted to uh, kind of go through the, the, the routine of how you use it. Um, because when you, when you create this, you'll actually, um, you'll actually do a, um, uh, well, let, let's, let's, let's go through the process. So when you want to uh, track motion on here, the, the, the portion of the program that I'm currently looking at, I'm looking in the workspace called motion tracking. So if you go to uh, window workspace motion tracking, this is the, the layout that I'm looking at because it, it brings this little tracker um, pane up here for you to use. And actually we're going to talk about it next week as well because it has these two notions here that we will talk about next week, which are warp stabilizer and stabilized motion. But for now, we're talking about these two. Um, so track motion is the point tracker. Track camera is the 3D camera tracker. So just if you needed a secret decoder ring, there you have it. Um, so if you were to track motion, you could, uh, click on this and what you'll notice is that actually um, there's already a tracker here, but it's, it, it kind of changes this. It brings up the video itself. It's like, you're not looking in the composition anymore. You're now looking at the footage. Okay. And um, this whole panel lights up with actually interesting things to, to tweak. 
Um, in this case, because there was a, a previous track done on this footage, uh, the tracker is called tracker two. There is a tracker one. That's the one that was previously done. Um, you have the motion source, which is the video footage. You have the track type, which is um, for what we're talking about. It's it, transform is the right one. If you were going to stabilize motion, it would be stabilized. If you wanted to actually uh, use, uh, if you wanted to track four corners of something, you could use the perspective corner pin. Um, you know, so you have some other options here for, for uh, tracking information. But for this particular one, we're going to use transform. When you use transform, you have these three different options. It can track position, rotation, and scale. Um, for this one, because we were just going to do a one point track, you would use position. If you wanted to use rotation, or scale, you'd want to use at least two tracking points um, or three if you really wanted to be solid uh, because the distance between those tracking points and their relationship to each other is going to, uh, will, will inform the rotation and scale properties of the track. Okay. So let's, let's, let's just get this started now so that you can see what we're doing. When you create this, you should see in the center of your composition, a little um, widget that basically is your track point. Um, you can grab the, uh, the big box and when you open it up, you'll see that it actually um, kind of rescales itself. When you center it over, when you center over it, you can see that the, um, it's kind of hard to see. It turns from a black uh, wedge to a white wedge. The white wedge actually changes the track point. So, um, so if you're moving inside of the, the box, if the box is sufficiently large such that you can, uh, you can move, if you're, if you're on the edge here, you're actually uh, changing the parameters of the tracker, whereas if you're black, you're, you're changing where it's where it's anchored to. So when you click on this, you drag it around, you'll see, wow, it's really zoomed in tight on all sorts of stuff. Um, so these are, uh, you know, these are all areas that you can choose to put your tracking point if that's what you want to do. Um, in the case of what we're talking about here, maybe. Maybe this will be a good spot. Maybe that'll be a good spot. Um, I was gonna choose something like choosing the, uh, choosing some part of a shirt. Maybe this gray blob. But again, remember, low contrast is not gonna be a great track. So you can choose any point. Uh, you, could, you could choose a point on the bricks. That will be um, uh, something of a challenge as we move down. So you could track a point on the wall um, and follow that through. So let's talk about what these two mean. So this actually, these have to do with the actual tracking. So depending on the motion um, that's being captured in the, in the shot, you, you might, uh, if, if the distance between one frame and the next is too much uh, and these are set too tight, these are set too small, uh, you might lose uh, from one frame to the next, you might lose where the track could be. So um, generally speaking, I like to, I like to be a little generous with these, uh, the point trackers. Uh, and again, I'm trying to find some, some space in there that's going to make sense. And then we'll, we'll open this up. Um, and when you get to that point, you can now analyze, which is that tracking uh, forward or backward. Since we were on the first frame, there's really no backward to do, so we'll, we'll analyze forward. And you can analyze one frame at a time, or you can analyze automatically, where it will just keep going until it either finishes or finds that it can't track anymore. So if you click forward one, you'll see that it's chosen to uh, it, it thinks that the track is on, it's, it's, you know, it's tracked it through that one frame. Um, and again, and again, so if we just click this, you'll see that it's following, whoa, whoa, what happened? All right, so you stop. You'll see that the track is now way off into the weeds. 
So let's move back um, to where we knew that we lost it. Looks like it, it decided at this point that it was off in the weeds. So we're gonna reacquire that spot. So I think that's the spot. And then we'll analyze forward from there. And you see that oh, it, it decided it's, it's so with patterns like this, it can be uh, a little bit fun and, and interesting. Um, so you see when it, the exact moment that it drops off, you want to grab this and move it back up to where you believe it should go. And then keep going. Okay, now it'll probably, oh, nope, it's still. So uh, fun with camera track, or fun with point track. And this is uh, kind of the, the, the part of it that can be deeply frustrating, but you know, again, um, if you chose, if we chose a better tracking point, maybe where his hair meets the shirt or something like that, it would have an easier time staying locked on. Nope, even then it still wants to jump around. All right. So you can see I fussed through this before. So I'm going to show you the tracker that we had originally. So this was uh, tracking, tracking that I did a little while back. And yeah, I chose the edge of his hair. That's why. So it's something that stays consistent throughout and um, tracks all the way to the end of the, uh, to the end of the media or the end of the clip. Okay, so what can you do with this information? Once you have a camera track or once you have a track, um, what can you do with this information? Um, well, you can apply it to a null object. Um, in this case, this is, um, well, it's turned off right now, but let me see if I can. So when you add the, uh, the ability on here, when you, when you, well, okay, let's, let's just recreate this. So we've got this, uh, if you guys want to, you can change the track to track one, tracker one, which is this completed track. Um, but realistically, the point that the process that we went through where you're walking through this and you're, then you're fixing all of the, the parts where the tracker goes off into the weeds, that is literally the process that arrived here. Okay, it's just we chose a different pix a different group of pixels to follow. And in this case, the tracker was a little easy, uh, was a little better able to um, stay on top of not losing its place. And so that is a function of the size of the inner and outer squares um, to be able to make sure that the track um, is successful from frame to frame. But you'll see that realistically, uh, the motion actually gets very bunched up um, in a lot of places, especially the further down the, 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 the walk is you can see that the keyframes are really not that far apart. Um, there's some areas where they're spread out like here and maybe a couple there, but realistically this is where he's moving the fastest across the frame of the video. Okay. So you take this tracker here, um, you want to edit a target. So we need a target for this. So uh, technically or basically what we've done, what we do is you can apply it to a different layer. Uh, in this case, we can do a null object. Uh, so if you go up to layer, new and null object, maybe I didn't do that fast enough. Layer, new, null object. You'll see that you get a null object and it doesn't have any properties to it. It's just a, an empty shell that is, um, on screen. Oh, that's why we don't see it because we were only looking at the footage. Um, so when you, uh, so you want to use this uh, as the kind of the receiver and you want this to receive that, that uh, information um, from the tracker. So you come over, make sure it says tracker one, transform, um, edit target, and you can actually choose apply motion to null number four, which is the null that we just created. And then when you do that, you'll, you then once you've, once you've chosen the target, 
uh, you can actually choose the options for how the um, uh, well this is these are these have to do with uh, options regarding how the tracker performs but once you're ready you can actually click apply and it will put paste all of that information both X and Y values to this null object so you'll see now that in that change by, by clicking apply and choosing X and Y, the X and Y values of every frame of this comp is uh, changed for this null object to correspond to that thing. So now if you watch this little null object, it's actually, let's turn that one off to make sure that we're looking at the right one. Um, you see that the null object just kind of follows his shoulder all the way down the video. It doesn't change. Oh, it jumps off a little bit there. So right here, you can see that it actually jumps off of his shoulder. I think I, I gave up on the track at that point. Um, because again, you're, you have to go and massage every frame of motion to, to make sure that it, it follows along. Um, it's a little tedious, but uh, it's better than basically setting a, um, a, a keyframe on every single frame of video yourself. Um, even if you, uh, even if this saves some of your pain and suffering, it's worth it. So what can you do with this? Um, with a null object like this, you can actually take any object or any layer and then, um, uh, you know, use that as the basis for um, having that object follow the null lock step okay the null, the, the null is the parent yeah you parent the, the the graphic this logo or something else you can do a solid or you can do a piece of text or um, anything that you like and as a 2d layer it just follows that null from the same uh, at the same distance and then you can have it basically bob along with the guy walking down the so the final thing that it looks like is not too bad. It's a little goofy looking because first of all, the logo doesn't change size. It doesn't look like it's in the space. It looks like it's clearly composited on top. Okay. It's not, a, it's not in the environment as such. If we added additional tracking points to that track to, to do position, to do rotation and scale, then this would, um, also, the scale, uh, the scale information here would also be keyframed alongside for every frame of this video. Okay, so that's point tracking. Point tracking is useful. It can, it does come up in a variety of of uh, situations. You should know how to uh, how to use it and take advantage of it. Um, I can't, I don't think that in my uh, documentary I used point tracking at all because I was kind of on a 3D camera tracker bend at the time. So, yeah, you know, it's like you, you, it, it comes and goes. Yeah, what's up, Nathan? So you had a no object set up to, and you called it the pick whip to make it a. Yeah, I use a pick whip to do that. It's. Um, Well, the tracker position here, that is a null object. Okay. It's the one that was already in the comp. Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And it works. So if you, if you actually were to delete it and um, uh, just have the video there and you needed to have, uh, and you come back to, to the motion tracker, uh, you don't have, you notice that there's no motion target. So there's no way to, um, there's no way to, to, there's nothing to, to apply it to. So you need something to apply it to. A, a null object or any layer really can be used to apply that motion track to, okay? It doesn't have to be a null object, but a null object is, an, is, a, is a convenient choice because then you can, you can parent things to that and have it be, uh, have those uh, item or, or those layers or, you know, one or more layers basically follow the lead of what the null object is doing. Um, 
so yeah, you, you create a new, I mean, you, again, you could do it with text, you could do it with a solid um, or a shape layer even. You could have those be the, the layer that has the, um, the motion track uh, uh, attached to it. So in this case, null five, um, I'm just gonna, well, actually I hit enter and that's not what I meant to do. Um, come over here, hit enter so that we're changing the name and we can call this tracker info or tracker data. Um, and now when you come back to this look, you can see that you can now edit the target and you can assign it to a layer. You do have um, uh, effect point control is another option. I think that has to do with if you choose a different track type, if you're choosing the corner pins, um, you can basically assign uh, that the corner pins will assign to a particular um, layers corner pin effect. Uh, but again, I'm going to show you a different way to do that. So you should always expect to experiment with this. So uh, when you get to, when you, once you see that your motion target is set right now, again, it says tracker data, you click apply, it's going to come up with the uh, options where you can choose what dimensions you're going to apply. You can choose X and Y or just X or just Y depends on what, what motion you're trying to, to manipulate. Um, we want it to follow this guy all the way through. So if it was just Y, or sorry, just X, um, this is what it would end up looking like. Um, and so now the tracker data is, um, the, the, you see that the tracker data just kind of moves horizontally across the screen. Doesn't really correspond to where this guy diminishes into the foreground. So. Uh, if you watch that null object uh, um, move through the move through the frame, it's just kind of following. It's following this point, but you know it's now it's down here on his arm, and so it's it's kind of odd to choose to do it that way. But it, again, it depends on what um, it depends on what you're trying to uh, to do with your motion tracker. So what, if you choose to, you can choose both X and Y, and now that null object basically follows this guy's shoulder all the way through the video, okay? Um, all right, so point trackers. Uh, again, if you needed to, you can use more than one, uh, you can use more than one uh, tracking point. You see that there is a second tracking point here. Um, but since we're only looking at position, it really only needs the one. Uh, if we chose rotation, then suddenly you see that it draws a line to that. Um, you only need two tracks, uh, two tracking points in order to uh, be able to move or uh, track the motion of any particular thing. So maybe we'll do it to the edge of his hat or something. I don't know. It's like, you, you tell me. Um, and let's give him a little bit of a generous tracking margin and then analyze forward. Oh, we lost it. <laughs> he, he lost us on the, uh, on the glass. Uh, which is pretty common. And that's not that's not um, surprising to have that happen. But so, yeah, it looks like that's the first frame where it goes off the rails. So let's find his hat. Oh, that's why. Look, there's low contrast. What a surprise. Um, so maybe the hat was not the right choice for for this particular exercise. Maybe it needed to be some other part of his shirt or I don't know. Can you enhance it so that it is easier to track? Um, that's a good question. You could. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sure. So watch this. Um, I was I was kind of following your lead on. I was like, yeah, exactly. This is how you do it. Um, you would duplicate this layer, the video layer right here. 
Um, and this would be the one that basically is um, your, your clean, your clean plate. Um, and then this one, you would actually go in and um, muck up. You might actually need to do an effect on it and then pre-compose the layer. So if you did a color effect on this to enhance the contrast, let's see what that would look like. Let's go back here. Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's one of these things where you can, um, we could, hell, let's, what the hell, let's put Lumetri on this bad boy and see what it does. So um, basic correction, you could up the exposure to really get the, the contrast where you need it so it's easier to follow. Um, and then once you have that, what you would do is you take this layer, pre-compose it, and then um, run the tracker on this footage so going back to motion tracking. Um, oh, come on now. All right. No, no, yes. All right. So in here, comp one. Oh, it still wants to play like that, huh? I see how you are. How would we? Um, well, you know, there's there's other ways that you can do this. You can actually adjust the the exposure in the view. Um, I'm not positive this helps with the track. This might help with the track, um, but you do have the ability to change the exposure in the view to to bring out detail, and maybe that will allow us to. Now see, but when you do the track here, you see that it's just showing you the original footage still. So I'm still thinking that it's it's doggedly trying to avoid using the comp as a proper piece of footage. Um, oh, I know what I did. Sorry. Let me let me reset this. I think I know what I did wrong. So we'll undo that. Okay, we're gonna pre-compose this. I'm gonna move all the attributes to the new comp and then click okay. Now, when you go into the comp here, you'll see that the, the Lumetri is in place and that was what was missing. So point tracker now, um, when you track this, it's tracking this footage as it stands. So it shouldn't change the, yeah, now we're, tra now we're tracking on this footage. So you would create a, um, can you create a new track on here? I'm wondering. Is it gonna is it gonna prevent? No, you're supposed to be able to do this. Oh, come on. Don't don't be, don't make me cry. No, no, it's fine. Um, because the idea of tracking to a comp is not a new. Um, is not a new notion. There we go. Okay, so I just had to come over here, click track motion. Now we're tracking this motion here. Okay, so now I can put the track points. It's just a process of finding uh, which is the first step, which is the second step, and so on. So if we wanted to track like his hair is a great, um, a great wispy sort of thing, especially on his back here. Um, so if we wanted to do rotation, we would increase the size of this one. Whoops. Increase the size of this one. Move it over here. And now we've got two points. Um, and because it's high contrast, it will probably track this pretty well. Um, And it's not perfect because you can see that it's kind of wandering. It's this, this tracking point is wandering a bit. And the other problem that we're gonna run into is that these track points are gonna overlap. And so um, they start to interfere with each other's um, tracking properties. And that can be uh, problematic to say the least. So if you ever need to uh, get up close and personal with your 
your tracker, you can do that to resize these so that the trackers kind of stay out of each other's way. Because that's literally the worst outcome is where they start to overlap. And if once these two inner boxes are on top of each other, uh, it's like crossing the streams of Ghostbusters. It just doesn't work very well after that. So try to avoid. Um, yeah, it, we're kind of we're kind of off in the weeds, but I'm, I wanted to get through this to. Yeah, exactly. His hair is moving around, and it's. Yeah. All right. So anyway, we got we got through the end of that. Let's um, let's back the train up and then see what we've got in terms of that track. I mean, it's it's okay. It didn't start at the first part. It started here. So there's a whole, you know, you could go, you could start here and track backwards. That would work too. Um, and then we'll probably, I'll see, yeah, it's wandering back down at the bottom of here. So, all right, whatever. Good times. Fun with, fun with point tracking. Um, but the idea is that now you have a, uh, something of a rotation and scale uh, capability if you wanted to add that to uh, whatever um, attribute you're going to uh, have floating on, you know, and it could be something that's just floating behind him, floating off in front of it. But generally speaking, you use this for 2D compositing. That's really where this does its best work is you're going to composite something that you're going to composite in two dimensional, not try to make it look like it belongs in the scene. Okay. Yes. And, okay. So each of these keyframes on the tracking data is you can change. I mean, so when you go here to motion trackers, you see that there are two trackers and they each have track points and each of the track points has, um, you know, uh, attach points and, you know, feature centers. So these, these, these little individual keyframes, are what those what represent those two track points the the when you paste or when you attack when you apply this track to a null object or some other layer um, it's a, it's applied to the position as individual keyframes and these are fully tweakable you can you can choose to uh, you know to to not use uh, the motion data um, or come in here and change the tracker in the comp, you change the tracker based on where it is now, not, uh, so if you decide that you want to nuance this and, and uh, you know, move it a little bit, one or two pixels in one direction or another, uh, you can absolutely do that. Um, since they're all selected, that's why I did that. So if I just wanted it to be one uh, keyframe, that would be just this one that I want to move around and tweak individually and then Okay, I'm happy with that one, and then moving on. So you can uh, you can go back and fix any of these as you're doing point tracking. All right, let's get let's get out of this and and talk about um, Mocha real briefly. How many of you guys have used Mocha before? That many? Awesome, cool. All right, uh, Mocha. Mocha is a uh, what they call a surface tracker. Okay, so it's not a point tracker um, in the usual sense is that it is actually paying attention to a larger group of pixels than just a, a, what a point tracker does. A point tracker is looking for individual uh, places or uh, areas of contrast, whereas a surface tracker is using um, kind of a, a bigger section of image to uh, to kind of plot its motion. So to get started with this, let's go to the motion AE tracker comp. Okay, this one is empty because it's actually, you gotta actually do something here. So if you go up to the animation menu and you go track and Mocha AE, what happens next is a little magical. It launches another program, which then starts bouncing on you um, or comes up like this. Uh, just click register later. Uh, experience this the first time that Mocha A has ever been run on this machine, which is what it will say every single time that you run it because this has had the freeze thing installed. Um, you can configure it now and that's fine, but these, these settings really have to do with where it stores its uh, intermediate information. Um, generally speaking, the defaults for me are fine. 
So I, um, and again, you can choose to turn this off, but the next time you play Mocha AE on this computer, it's gonna bring up this exact sequence of information. So if you just click start, it's going to basically show you this is the name of the video clip. It has a, a default location, which is underneath the, the, the location of the After Effects um, project. And then you're gonna import this clip. You wanna basically, it's gonna select frames zero to 1055. And if you click okay, it's, it brings it into this view here. Now you notice it's, it's got the whole media clip, but that it actually has preset the in and out points to match the in and out points from the comp that you, um, that you ran it against. So, Mocha, fun times. This is a great, uh, it's, it's a very capable program for what it does, okay? So, uh, generally speaking, it's going to, it behaves like you want to set up um, individual areas that you want, surfaces that you want tracked. So, for fun, let's track part of the brick wall because that'll work. Uh, so, Following along, why don't you grab the pen tool where it says X, and we're gonna create what's called an X spline layer, okay? And if you come over into the wall section, you can actually, um, just, just for, for fun, um, you maybe, maybe do it somewhere in the middle of the frame, like right around here. Uh, it doesn't, you can choose to do it down further, that's fine. I've done it successfully down further as well. Um, eh, what the hell, let's do it down. Uh, so you start by clicking one and then you see that you've, you've got this other uh, node. And what you should try and do is follow the edge of the, the mortar line on the brick. Because we're trying to basically set an, uh, an outline for a region. So you click again at that corner and then it starts to head downward. And now you've got a little triangle. Maybe this comes down to the... Uh, and try to keep it vertical as in relation to the, the, the vertical lines of the bricks. And then get to this point here, click there, and then drag to where it's like that. Okay, and then when you get to this last one, if you right click or control click, it will, um, it will basically say, okay, that's the surface you want to track. That's part one. Oh, Ben. Nothing's showing up. Nothing's showing up. No. For real. This is why you use your own laptop. So, um, okay. so uh, did you go from After Effects and you said Um, okay. No, uh, you can actually choose the media clip. What? Uh, download that again from the server. I think that's part of your problem. Yes, same thing. Nothing's showing up for uh, I have that tool selected pen tool. So with the click on the screen, nothing actually shows. Well, that's no fun either, is it? Um, what's funny is that you do have, oh, uh, your playhead's outside of the internet points, that's why. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what people were noticing is that if you, if you click outside the, the playhead, uh, you're like, I don't see anything. And what you'll notice is that there's a, this red zone are the frames that came from this composition. So you should, uh, so, and, and if, you, if you see that, you'll see that it's really just on the screen for this first one. I'm gonna basically zoom this a little bit to try and get a little more real estate going here. Okay, so now we've done the first part where we've tracked the area of interest. This is where we, this is the surface we want to track. Now we actually need to define the planar surface that we're actually gonna track inside of here. Um, and that's where the, this next thing is. So you see that it puts a rectangle up on the screen that fits inside of this bounding uh, tracking area. 
Um, the little, the, the, uh, this little S box up here, show planar surface, okay? Um, and when you move each corner, you'll see that it, it creates this little zoom in area that uh, allows you to choose an area to track. And you should pick, again, you should be picking something where it's on, uh, it's on a, an area where there's some good contrast, like maybe that corner. And um, then we come over here. We want this to be vertical. So you might be looking at this fitting in that vertical line area and then um, choosing maybe this corner here. And then finally, this corner here to try and complete the, and, and, and you know, don't kill yourself. So if you find that this is the wrong, uh, this is not big enough, you can always grow the, uh, the, the little X-spline tracking layer. Okay, but this should look more or less like the, the dimensions that you're, you're looking to track. Now, this is why we, we like it to be a surface tracker. This is why this, uh, what this is really well suited for is if you take a photo or if you're taking video of somebody holding a mobile phone or a computer screen or a television and you want to be able to replace the contents of that television screen, computer screen or mobile phone, this will work really, really well. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, you can actually set this shape of this and this shape will change according to how the camera changes. Alex, you have a question? You mean like adding text to the side of a vehicle? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like uh, basically surface trackers like this can, uh, would replace uh, like buses that have the ads on the sides of the buses. You could do that. You could change it to say something else like, you know, whatever you want. I mean, I'm not kidding. It's like whatever you want. It can be, you know, it, it, I, and, and the, the mind reels at the possibility because the, the rabbit hole has no bottom. So you, you can, you know, you can choose to, to uh, track the surface of a car, of a street, of a wall, of a screen. Uh, anything that's two-dimensional-ish um, can be tracked. Can you track the surface of somebody's skin? Yes, you can. So this could be, we could do, you could put a tattoo on somebody's arm using this. You track it and then you basically would apply that tattoo as a corner pin. We'll talk about how this is gonna work in a second. So the possibilities, yes, you start to see like, ooh, this is tasty, I like this. So, uh, but the, the tools are very similar to what we've talked about. They're not the same, but they're similar. So what we've got is we've currently got this one tracker. This is one layer right here. You can do multiple layers, okay? It doesn't need to be just one, but for this example, we're using one. Um, okay. So the same tools, when you come over here, you look at this area here that says track, and you can basically just play the video forward, and it will track that surface, okay? And the track will be reasonably good. It's not, uh, I'm not gonna spend the time nuancing it everywhere, but you're, you, you're getting a sense of where, you see that the track is wandering a little bit. Um, so you could stop it and then go and fix it if you wanted to. So you see that this track is a little bit off um, in terms of it's kind of wandered upward. So maybe go back uh, some number of frames until it looks like it's back in where it needs to be and then track forward frame by frame and see where it starts to wander and then you can bring it back into line as you get closer. So it looks like here's where it's starting to run a run amok. So I mean it's it is also off uh, the trackers off a little bit here and over here as these move through uh, as the surface moves through it's going to continue to do that. But for efficacy, I'm just going to run this back to the, um, just go ahead and let the track run for the moment. So it's reasonably fast. 
uh, on this hardware, okay? So this used to be something that was not within reach with the computers that used to be in this lab. So that's the good news. The uh, less good news is that um, the, once you've done the track, you're basically only partway there. And you can see, like I said, the, the distortion of this is pretty, pretty intense. It probably, it, need, it does need to be adjusted so that it is more in line with um, your expectations. You might need to increase that and this so that it is uh, more like what you're expected to see, okay? And every time you do those changes, if you change the shape of the tracker here, you'll see it, it drops a new green arrow. These are keyframes in Mocha, okay? These green dots are keyframes where you've gone and made some manual adjustment to the tracker, not to the surface, this you can adjust at any point, but just the tracker so that the trackers um, or this, uh, this layer. Okay, so we'll keep on going and so on. Okay, so when you get to the end, so let's, let's plausibly say that we've gotten all the way to the end here. I don't feel like going another several minutes on this because I want to get to the 3D camera track. Um, but you, you finish your track, now what? Okay, so in, in Mocha, it's kind of weird because you're like, what am I doing here? You do have a significant amount of, uh, I've not shown you a, a fraction of what this tool can actually do, but for, for basic surface tracking, this is how, this is the mechanics of it, okay? When time comes to get data out of here, uh, you come up to the file menu of Mocha AE and you should see export tracking data. And if you select that on the menu, it's going to come up with a little choice. You have a choice of three uh, avenues. The one that I'm going to suggest, the one that works pretty well consistently is corner pinning because what we're talking about is you're tracking the four corners of a surface. And so if you choose corner pin, um, and then copy to clipboard, what that will do is it's going to take this track data that it's gotten to this point and um, copies it to the clipboard and then you can switch back to After Effects, come in um, to, not to, the, not to the media clip that you, that you sent over, but um, uh, to a null object or, well actually, eh, that's not true either. So, go ahead. I chose the one that says uh, includes motion blur. So um, again, you can go over here, After Effects corner pin. There's one that says corner pin only, supports um, RG warp and Mocha import, which I don't really use. Um, it also doesn't, uh, tends to distort more um, as, the, as it's run through. But now what, what we'll do is you copy the corner pin, Copy that to the clipboard. Then if you don't have this, you should um, grab this, or in the worst case scenarios, you can grab the video a second time and drag it, um, drag it in. But drag this, um, this logo as a, as a new layer, okay? And then add under the effects, um, under effect, you go down to, where is it? Distort, corner pin. And now you've added the corner pin to that, to this logo. Once you have this, you can then paste from the, from the clipboard and it will overwrite the tracking information and place that on the wall. And so this is, Basically, I mean, and you can tell that, like I said, we, we were kind of sloppy with the, the track, so it's not perfect, but it is, um, it does show reasonably well what we're trying to accomplish here. So um, as you move through, you see that the, the motion, and again, like I said, the track was kind of sloppy. Um, it does, it can be a better job. We'll, we, can, we can repeat this with the next, um, the next trick, but you can tell when the track data runs out, right? As soon as that track data runs out, no more motion for the, the, the logo. 
But uh, up to that point, the motion does track, it does follow it along, and this is a way to remap uh, some piece of, of content, and it does not need to be a, it does not need to be a still image. Um, I've done this before where I would go into the project and I would duplicate this layer and then I would apply the corner pin to that. So effect, distort, corner pin, and then paste the tracking data on it. And now you've got a really interesting notion of, oh, and remember it, it actually applies at the where the playhead is. So keep that in mind. You want your playhead to be at the beginning when you paste it so that it behaves as it should. Okay. So whoop, there I go moving things around. All right. So there's the, the idea of running um, surface tracking. Okay. So it's, it's pretty fun. It's kind of interesting. Um, and it is with, with significant, and this is not something that's super easy to do. Uh, it's all, it's easy to, it's easy to set up camera track. It's hard to have camera tracking or it's hard to have surface tracking look really clean and elegant. It takes a lot of patience. And, um, so, you know, your mileage may vary. All right. Last one. 3d camera tracker. So, and this is part of the, what I want you guys to work on in class, but I'll get you started. Um, the idea behind 3D Camera Tracker is uh, you come over to the tracker in, uh, whoop, pardon me, select your footage, and if you click track camera, in fact, the 3D Camera Tracker is already here, so I'm going to delete it. I want to redo it again. Um, you, you select your footage and click track camera, it automatically starts analyzing your footage, okay? It automatically applies the effect and starts to work. So if you're curious what's happening, if you have your effect controls open on the, on the left-hand side, you'll see that the status of, the, uh, of the, the analysis is happening. It says it's initializing, and then it starts working on one frame at a time. There's 151 frames. This used to take a long time in class on this workstation. Now it just takes, um, you know, like a, a minute. Okay, once it's done, then the banner switches to solving camera and then we're left with this unique looking um, kind of interface. You now have all of these dots and these dots are different tracking points that the the that the um, the three D camera tracker has chosen to place in the footage. And generally speaking, you're going to want if you if you scrub through, you'll see that they follow those dots will um, generally stay in place. Sometimes new ones will appear and other ones will disappear and um, you see that it really likes this vertical line right there. So, and then as you scrub your, your mouse over the screen, you'll see that you get a, uh, a variety of kind of this target. Um, and so this target ends up being uh, a way to kind of choose what uh, gives you a solid surface uh, based on three points that it that the that the mouse that that are kind of between where the mouse is laying so when you look at this you think oh that kind of looks like uh, a layer uh, or a surface that would work um, if you want to be more if you want to have more confidence you can click and lasso a bunch of these and then it's going to be even more confident as to what that surface is okay so if you click and you drag the mouse around a, a selection of these tracking points, it will <clears throat> use all of them to help inform its decision as to what's the surface. 
So once you've got it to this point and you want to actually like do something, um, you can either click create camera or you can actually write or control click or whatever on this and the context menu for this target will give you some options, okay? <clears throat> At each point, each of these tracking points you can actually um, use to drop um, text, solid, or null uh, layers. So you can place, on every one of these points, you can place one, or you can use the combination of one, uh, the combined data from those 17 that are selected to create a text, solid, or null. And then since there isn't a 3D camera, it's going to add that camera on here. So for fun, we're going to create a null and a camera. And what happens is this, this target stays put, okay? And so if you want, this is what I was going to suggest to you is like, come over where the center of that target is. And you see that the, the mouse changes from the arrow pointer to that little um, a wedge with the, with the four compass uh, points on it. If you click and drag that target, you should be able to make it behave like it is on that surface, meaning that you can drag it anywhere and it's going to behave like it's there. Okay, so um, you can choose that, test it out, make sure that you're, you're happy with it. And then uh, once you've done that, you actually are, you can move off to uh, where the null object is. And you'll see that the null that it creates is right there. And the Z is pointing out away from the wall. The X and the Y look more or less there. I would actually suggest that maybe you need to rotate uh, on the x-axis a little bit. The y looks like it's a little bit out. So you can click and drag on uh, using the rotate tool or press W. Um, you can click on the x arrow and you can roll moving up or down. You can kind of get that looking like it's the, the y is attached. It's pointing in the right direction. So now this looks more or less, I mean, even the, even the, the z is probably a little bit out. You could probably uh, you move the X a little bit down. Now that's pretty, that's pretty solid right there. So now this null object is kind of floating on the wall. So as you move into that space, that null object is right there the whole time. Okay. Now this is not using point tracking. This is basically creating a 3D environment. So if you switch, if you can switch, to a top-down view and zoom out sufficiently. Um, oh, ha, that was funny. Um, you know, let's switch over here and switch, zoom out. Okay. Um, maybe not that much. Maybe we maybe we make it this much. All right. Um, press spacebar to move that up. You see that there's a camera. Okay. There's our camera, and there's the the parameters of the camera. There's a field of view. Here's the motion that the, the camera takes through the, through the scene. So, and if you play through it, you'll see that the camera moves forward down in the, in the scene. So it is actual 3D motion that is uh, being played, uh, you know, in virtual, so in virtual space, this is behaving like the, the camera that we shot this with. Now, this opens up a wide variety of things that you can do. This is what the, this is the basis of match motion, okay, or uh, match moves, is that you can, um, you can place things in here. So that's, that's kind of where we get the, the fun part of this is where you're, uh, you come back to the 3D camera tracker. If you ever you wanted to see that, uh, that tracker data again, you can click on this. Um, you make sure that it says click render track points and it will definitely make sure that these are up on the wall. And then um, if you're using the point, the selection tool or press V, you should be able to choose, again, you can lasso a bunch of tracking points and that's not enough. You can choose a bunch of tracking points and, oh, that's a bad choice. Choose a bunch of tracking points or maybe not all of them. 
No, see, it's, we're still not getting there. Oh, I see, it's using a tracking point way over here. Jeez, that's crazy. Um, if you can't see the track points, you can scale them up so that you can see them. Okay, so you can, you can scrub this and, and create the, so if you're having trouble seeing ones that are off in the background, you can scale this up so that you can get a better look at them. And then um, use that to, well, or not. I'm still not convinced that this is the best. Well, that's better. Still not perfect. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, if you create a solid or a text, what you're going to do is you'll see that it creates text on the on that surface as a 3D layer automatically. So that text is there. And you can now go in and either using the rotate tool or pressing P or R on the on the uh, the keypad, you'll see that the orientation is kind of pretty whack. Um, so we'll rotate this this way. We'll rotate this, and that's actually pretty decent. And um, okay, so this actually should be zero, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> So now we can rotate on the X axis or the Y axis or the Z axis to, to kind of fine tune this. If you need to move the position at all, you can move the position. Um, I, I tend to drag the, the, uh, the points around. If you need to uh, color it something different so that you can see what it's doing, um, that's obviously your prerogative or you can put this somewhere where it's more contrast. You can scale it so it behaves just like an object in that space would behave. And the nice thing is, is that you set it here, but as you move backwards, that text is still there and it still follows that. So it still behaves like it's in the space. And this doesn't even, this, this doesn't even start the, the discussion of adding lights. You can add lights in here that correspond to the sun, you can see that this is all sunlight right here. So you could add a parallel light source in the 3D space to be able to cast light on this text. And then you create a shadow catcher. That's the other thing that we were, that was talking about here is that um, you can actually create on the footage. So if you went here and you right clicked or control clicked, you can create what's called a shadow catcher and a light. And what that's gonna do is it actually creates a light for the scene. So you instantly see that the text now uh, responds to that light being in the scene. Um, if we wanted to have a look at what that light, where that light was, you see that it's actually placed oddly to some other side, um, but it's way out in front of the text. So if, if you look at where the text is on the screen, you'll see, whoop, I did it again. Click over here, zoom way out. So you can see there's our text and there's our shadow catcher. So if you select the text, you'll see there's our text and there's our shadow catcher. We can move our shadow catcher so that it is underneath the text and then move the light so that it actually casts a shadow on the text. Now, can we start to see that? Yes, we can. It's a little weird. Um, and that might be because of where the shadow catcher is actually placed above the text. So if you bring the shadow down, now all of a sudden you see the text is, is casting a shadow that corresponds roughly to how the light is in the, from the sun, okay? So now we've created a text layer that behaves like it is part of this live action scene. It's not perfect, but it's, I mean, again, this is a class and this is a demo, um, but you see that it tracks really, it tracks really well and um, the other part of this that we will get to before we move off into the weeds um, is adding something to this 
uh, to the wall here. Um, you can have it be, again, you could have it be a, a still image, like this logo. The logo could be on the wall. You could be a poster. It could be a, a different video. It could be, you know, you name it. Rabbit hole has no bottom, really. I, I wasn't kidding. And add that as a um, as a, a a layer. So if you were to, um, we have the null that's from the wall. We can use that to boss this layer around. So we'll take uh, take a logo, make it 3D. So now all of a sudden it's in the same space as the as the light. Um, and then if you take the, the null, uh, its position, and you take the third streak Aleworks and you do its position, you can actually, holding down option and clicking on this, the stopwatch, changes this to an expression. So now you're going to basically have the position follow a, a particular uh, value in another, uh, another object or another layer. And so you can take the position and drag it to the position there. And now the position here is, is relative, to, um, relative to this. You can also copy and paste this position onto that so that it is placed exactly where this, um, where this null goes. Uh, you can also do it with the rotation. So we'll do that or the orientation, right? So we'll take the orientation, copy, paste. And now that logo is exactly where that null object is. Um, and we haven't really parented the, uh, the null or we haven't parented this to the null directly, but we have changed the position of it um, to follow that. That's why, so when you come over here and you hit position, you'll see that these are red. And if you twizzle down, you'll see that it says expression position and that there's the expression that actually is updating the position of this layer based on the position of this layer. Okay, so these values will whatever layer, whatever position this is, this will be copied to it for every single frame, okay? And so it just kind of looks like somebody stuck a sticker on the wall to, uh, so, and if it's too small, you can hit S for scale and scale it up. If it's rotated incorrectly, it looks like it's a little bit wonky. You can, again, you can hit W for the rotate tool and uh, kind of, modify it so that it looks like it's a little more appropriate. You can tweak those things. And those settings will stay as you move. So now this Third Street Aleworks logo is on the side of the, the hallway. The, you didn't know that we were getting corporate sponsorship for the school. Wouldn't it be nice? Um, so the uh, last thing for tonight, was to, um, if you turn this off and then we click off of it, you can kind of get a sense of what the final look is gonna be. Switch this back to one view so that we're looking at just it. Go back to the beginning and play it, okay? So 3D trackers, it's, 3D camera trackers are not a panacea. They, there is footage that it, that it will fail on. Um, difficult tracking in 3D track and 3D camera track is um, is a thing. It's not automatic. Um, it sure looks automatic when you when I show you footage that it's well suited for. Uh, which like this, uh, walking down a hallway, it's a single focal length. It's not doing wild motion. If the motion was much more varied, if it wasn't just a dolly you know, even though it's a walk, if it was just a dolly down a hallway, that's super easy for a computer to track. If you're, if you're panning and walking and moving through a space, that's a much more challenging situation for a camera tracker to resolve. And so you may end up spending a lot of time 
fussing with the track to make sure that it's able to to track the motion successfully across the entire clip. Um, there are classes given just on how to do that, or you know, and some of it is just hard one experience. It's not something that you're gonna you can sign up for out of a out of, you know out of a course catalog. It's something that you experiment with, fool around with, ask your ask your your colleagues and other people that do motion capture and VFX and how that you know how they do it because generally speaking they'll share that information with you um, because it's you know they they know they they were in a situation where they had to figure it out and so um, I've never had to do any of the motion capture or any of the motion tracking in my documentary is this this does a fantastic job of doing the motion track it will create a 3d camera rock solid locked on um, the only thing you benefit you could benefit from when doing the in the doc is having knowledge of what camera what focal length i was using for the lenses sometimes will help with the track you can tell the the you know you can tell it what uh kind of attributes in terms of the field of view that the camera has when it was the live action footage uh, will help the 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 software to to try and do a better job of of tracking individual pixels if there's a lot if like i was experimenting today with my with my 60d and i have a really beautiful l series fisheye lens eight millimeter to 15 millimeter fisheye zoom really beautiful lens you know it's it's really really nice very expensive and um uh, but I was I was shooting some some footage thinking oh maybe I'll use that tonight for motion track um, and I was unable to easily get it because there's so much barrel distortion at the edges of of a wide angle shot that that starts to confuse the software into what it what am I seeing why you know these things are distorting and so it's not able to to do a, an effective job of tracking. Um, Okay, so uh, that was your kind of intro to motion track. Uh, I know that you did some motion track already in your homework, but hopefully this helps cement some of that. Um, next week, what we're going to talk about is uh, the other two pieces of the uh, the other two pieces of the tracker uh, lore over here, which is stabilized motion and warp stabilizer. So how do you uh, deal with motion that is, or how do you deal with shaky cameras and stabilize, uh, stabilizing motion, dampening uh, motion in your video? without uh you know getting too crazy there's stabilized motion which is the old way of doing it which is very canonically difficult uh i will show you some footage that w it it will definitely raise your eyebrows as to wow that's troublesome um but warp stabilizer much more interesting um we might also talk about time warp as part of that as well uh so we're we're starting to move into more advanced effects and um, then I think the week after that we'll start talking about um, uh, either we can talk about rotoscoping and key uh, chroma key or we can talk about color work inside of After Effects though with the Lumetri color tool you guys generally have uh, you know teaching you guys Lumetri in Premiere the same controls are in After Effects and it does uh, behaves the same way. So a lot of it is, uh, I don't know that it's worth going into a huge explanation a second time of the same content. So yeah. Um, any questions before I walk around and answer questions? Questions for the whole room? No? Okay. So uh, if you are, if you've 
need help, need, have questions, uh, need anything, ask, and I will endeavor to help.